Well, today is a special day in that we are continuing our series on the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of the Kingdom, and we're going to be talking this morning about the temptation of Jesus. Our text is taken from Mark chapter 1, beginning in verses uh, verse 12, as we speak about the temptation of Jesus, and we're going to just read two verses this morning and then take some time to expound upon them. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the inspiration of your word. We thank you for the authority of your, of your scriptures. But God, we also thank you that you have given us your spirit and you have told us that your spirit would lead us into all truth. We thank you this morning, Lord, for the truth that is your word. And we thank you for the affirmation from your scripture that you will lead us into truth and give us the wisdom that we need as we ask. And so this morning we pray, Lord, that you would illuminate the scriptures to our hearts and minds and that you will cause it to find a home in our lives and find practical application to our everyday Christian living. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we come to an important subject, the temptation of Christ. And there are a lot of reasons why this is an important and significant subject. Probably the one that stands out in my mind the most is that through the temptation of Jesus, we find an account of a Savior who we can relate to. And oftentimes, when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, it may be difficult for us to relate to him because we see him in his deity. We see him walking on the water. We see him opening up blinded eyes. We see him turning water into wine. And we say, well, I can't do that. And we find it difficult to relate to him. But in the temptation of Christ, we see the humanity of Christ. And certainly, if there is something that we can relate to, it's knowing what it's like to be driven into the wilderness, so to speak. To find yourself in a desolate place, isolated. To find yourself in a place where you're being sorely tried and sorely tempted. And that was, that was the reality of Jesus, that he faced temptation. And so when we come to the temptation of Christ, we find that it's a highly significant subject because if nothing else, it's a subject that helps us relate to the Savior and more importantly recognize that we have a Savior who relates to us. Can you say amen? If you were to look at the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, you would find that they give a very detailed account of the temptation of Christ. That the authors go into a lot of detail about what happened. What did Satan say when he came to Jesus? And what were the ramifications of it? And what were uh, the ways that Jesus responded? And you'll find that God puts a premium on his word. That here, Jesus, the incarnate word, speaks the inscripturated word. And as he is tempted by Satan, he comes back with scripture, using it as a sword of the spirit in his own defense. But when you come to Mark, you'll find that what is typical of Mark, here is a succinct bird's eye view, rapid fire description of the temptation of Christ. In fact, we read it just a moment ago. It amounts to two verses. Two verses that don't include any detail about the nature of the temptations, no detail about what it was Satan was tempting Jesus to do. It's just kind of a helicopter overfly of the temptation of Christ. He says Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. He's tempted by Satan, he was with wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. It's brief, it's to the point, it's rapid fire. It's typical of Mark's summary perspective of the life of Christ. And yet even in this pithy description, there is much to be learned. And so with that in mind, today's focus is going to be on four features of Christ's temptation and some lessons for today. We begin by looking at the four features of Christ's temptation. The first feature, the Spirit drove him. The Spirit drove him. 
drove him into the wilderness. Read it with me again from Mark 1.12. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Now, when you first read that, it might be a little unsettling. It might seem actually a little bit strange because I want you to think about the events that immediately preceded this. Jesus came to John the Baptist as he was in the Galilee at the River Jordan baptizing people, preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand preparing the way for the Lord. And Jesus was baptized. And we have seen that this was, spiritually speaking, the coronation of Jesus, where heaven literally was rent asunder, and the voice of the Father came, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And of course, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came and alighted on Jesus. What a magnificent day, the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus comes up out of the water, anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit to do the will of the Father. And then, juxtapose that powerful, beautiful scene with the very next scene. And the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. A little unsettling, isn't it? I mean, talk about a shock factor. Jesus goes from being surrounded by the masses that were there being baptized, being enveloped in the, the, the immediate presence of his Father, being anointed by the Holy Spirit, the voice from heaven, the heavens torn asunder, all of that glory, to being isolated in a desolate place filled with wild beasts. And that's a shocking contrast. But what makes it even more unsettling is that this was the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that alighted on him, the same Spirit that was enduing him with power was the Spirit that drove him into the wilderness. We need to recognize sometimes in our lives we will experience a wilderness situation and we are tempted to think that it's Satan getting the upper hand. But there are times when we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of the wilderness, smack dab in the middle of God's will. That he was the one who drove us into the wilderness even as he drove Jesus into the wilderness. So the question then is, how could a God who in one moment says, this is my beloved son, in the very next moment, drive that beloved son into the wilderness. And perhaps we wonder the same thing about ourselves. God loves me. Why am I going through this? If God loves me, why do my prayers seem to be bouncing off the ceiling and coming right back to mock me? If God loves me, why do I have to wait for his answer to come? It's very clear from this passage of Scripture that there are times when we are in the wilderness and we are there because the Holy Spirit has driven us even as it drove Jesus. The wilderness was known as a place of evil, a place of destruction, a place of danger to the Israelites. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, I don't understand if God is a God of love and God knows all that there is to know, how is it he could allow Satan into the Garden of Eden knowing the results? Knowing ahead of time what would happen with the temptation and the fall of man and the resulting curse and introduction of disease and death and suffering into the world. How could a God of love do that? And certainly it's beyond the scope of this message today to go into all of the details and to explain the where's and, and the how-to's of God's greater plan. But we do know that God is sovereign, that God is good, that God is loving, and that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. And so what that tells me is that even when I find myself in the middle of the wilderness and it seems like the wild beasts are nipping at my heels, God is with me. 
He's never going to leave nor forsake me, and he is working all things together for my good. Sometimes we can be in the middle of God's will and be absolutely miserable. Miserable. Oh, Pastor Greg, aren't you being a little dramatic? Well, don't you think Joseph was a little miserable when doing the right thing landed him in jail? Now, obviously, he, cont he continued to do the right thing, continued to show strong character. But I'm going to tell you, friends, just as a human being and from a human's perspective, if I were doing the right thing and I landed in jail as a result of it, I would not be thrilled with my circumstances. And it would take the Spirit of God in me, encouraging me to rise above that, as the apostles did and sing songs of thanksgiving and praise to God in the midnight hour. Because part of Greg would be a little bit miffed that he ended up in prison for doing the right thing. And I'm just being honest with you. You can be in the middle of God's will sometimes and find yourself in a miserable circumstance. Why? Because God is infinitely more interested in your character than in your comfort. You see, he is all about developing in us the character of Jesus Christ, maturing us and growing us up, which means sometimes we'll be in a difficult, even in a wilderness situation, and we are there precisely because the Spirit has driven us there. But God does have a greater plan. And so here we find that when Jesus is driven into the wilderness, part of what that represents from a symbolic standpoint, once again, Jesus the prophet, Jesus the Messiah, the one who relates to those whom he will save, has now been baptized in the river and driven to the wilderness as Israel was baptized in the Red Sea and driven to the wilderness. And Jesus is relating to those whom he will save. Well, if we're go going to understand the full ramifications of what it meant to be driven into the wilderness, it's helpful to know what this, this word that we translate as drive in the English meant. And it comes from ekbalo, a Hebrew word that means to expel, to send away forcefully. And what is interesting to note is that this is the same word that is used when Jesus expelled demons. It was a forceful driving them out. And so this was not a pleasant invitation of the Spirit of God saying, hey Jesus, why don't you towel dry your hair? Could you just do me a favor and go into the wilderness for a while? When you, when you get the rest of that water out of your ears, could you just... No! This was the Spirit of God driving him with force into the wilderness. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that he was angry with Jesus. He had just, you know, by the voice of the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am what? Well pleased. But the idea here, and I love this, the idea is God going on the offense against evil that he is thrusting Jesus with force into the wilderness for a face-to-face -face combat with Satan himself. And so Jesus, this one who is fitting, is now endued with power from the Holy Spirit and is going face-to-face -face with Satan himself. God going on the offense. It kind of reminds me of when David was fighting Goliath. And the whole Israeli army is standing there shaking in their boots. And King Saul is hiding in his tent. And this little shepherd boy David says, I'll fight him. My God has delivered me from the paw of the bear, from the paw of the lion. Surely he will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. And the Bible says that after he tries on Saul's armor and decides, I don't need this, it's too big for me anyway, and puts it off, he takes five smooth stones and a slingshot and sneaks up on the giant? No. He taunts the giant and then runs at a dead pace right for him. And that's the idea here. 
that Jesus Christ, endued with the power of the Holy Spirit, was thrust to the front line to combat Satan face to face. It was God going offensive. May that encourage you this morning. As you struggle in your humanity, as you relate to the Savior who was tempted, and, and unlike Him, we fail. And yet what comfort it is to know that we serve a God who went on the offense against Satan and He took the battle to Him. He met him on his turf. He went to the wilderness, the place of evil, the place of desolation, and combated Satan there, making an open show and spectacle of him at the inauguration of his ministry, even as he would at the end of his ministry. So the first feature, if you will, of Christ's temp temptation is that the Spirit, it was the Spirit of God that drove him. A second feature, Satan tempted him. Now there are two senses of temptation here, a positive and a negative. From a positive standpoint, this was God demonstrating Jesus' fitness. Years and years ago, the Union Pacific Railroad was being constructed. And there was uh, one of these really large canyons out west that this massive trestle had been built across. And the engineer had a train loaded with enough weight to simulate two trains, twice the normal load. And then he had that train run out onto that trestle, spanning this great distance, and then he said, park it and leave it. And they left that train sitting there for 24 hours. And in the midst of that time, at some point, a worker came up to the engineer and says, what are you trying to break the bridge? And the engineer responded, no, I'm trying to prove that it will not break. He had absolute confidence in the fitness of that bridge. Likewise, God had absolute confidence in the fitness of Jesus. And so when Jesus was being sent into the wilderness to be tempted, the positive aspect, meaning a, a, a trial, if you will, from God, was that he wanted to prove that Jesus would not fail. To prove that Jesus was fit. To prove that Jesus was indeed the Messiah whom he had anointed. The one with whom he was well pleased. You see, God knew the heart of Jesus. He also knows our hearts. But because he knew the heart of Jesus, he knew Jesus would not fail. And he desired Jesus to be successful and expected Jesus to be successful. In fact, he knew full well that he would be. And so from a positive standpoint, the wilderness temptation of Jesus was God proving the fitness of his son. No one in succeeding generations would be able to come and say Jesus was not quite good enough. Jesus was not quite holy enough. Jesus was not quite righteous enough to be the savior of the world. Because we could point back to the temptation of Christ and we could say, as the writer of Hebrews did, he was tempted in all ways like as we are and yet was without sin. The sinless one. The one that it was against his very nature to sin. Jesus. You see, the world couldn't see the heart of the Son but we could gain confidence in his character by seeing how he withstood the onslaught of hell and yet came forth triumphant. That he faced the best Satan could throw at him and yet he did not fail. It also gives us a fuller understand, uh, understanding of the son's identity. That not only is he fully human, he is fully God. Amen. <laughs> because if you're going to withstand temptation, especially from the mouth of the devil, you'd better be God. <laughs> Anything short of that and you will utterly fail. As we all know, from Adam to the newest born, we are, we are born in sin, but not Jesus. Born of a virgin. Satan also, also saw the power of God's resolve. You see, Satan's temptations against Jesus were utterly and completely powerless. 
And that set the stage at the beginning of Jesus' ministry for his continued triumph and victory over Satan throughout his three, three and a half year ministry. We think of the triumph of Jesus as the cross and the empty tomb, and rightfully so, for that is the summit. But I want you to recognize that Jesus continued to be tempted throughout his ministry. And the gospel writers refer to Jesus telling his disciples. He commends them because they have been with him through his temptations. Well, Jesus was alone in this experience. But these are recorded for us so that we will understand a little bit more of what he faced. And yet, time and again, Jesus confronted Satan. Jesus confronted evil spirits. He confronted demoniacs. And with a word, he delivered them. How could he exercise such authority? Well, friends, he had already taken on Satan himself, the prince of demons, and had conquered him in the wilderness right at the beginning of his ministry. The Bible tells us that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And what that tells me is that he understands us in our sufferings. He understands us in our temptations and in our trials. Thankfully, and praise be unto God, he came through spotless. He was the spotless, blemishless Lamb of God. And yet it wasn't because he avoided temptation. It was because he conquered temptation. And so he understands us in our suffering and he relates to our needs. Let's get a show of hands this morning. How many of you used to watch MASH on TV? Used to watch MASH. I really enjoyed the show. One time on one of the episodes, the unit's priest, uh, Father Malkehi, went to minister to a young soldier who had just come from the front lines and was wounded. But when this young soldier realized that the priest had never been anywhere near the fighting, he, in so many words, told the priest, we don't have anything to talk about. He had no respect for the priest and probably felt like we cannot relate to each other. I'm on the front line fighting. You're back here at the MASH unit. Well, later on in that same episode, circumstances shifted. And Father Mulcahy, he found himself in a place where bombs were going off and he had to, to uh, minister to a young man and literally help save his life right there in the front lines. Later on, he came back to that same soldier, and that soldier wanted to talk then. Why? Because he knew that they shared that experience, that there was something about this priest that he could relate to. Friends, we've got a much greater priest than Father Mulcahy. We have the great high priest, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he has faced temptation. He's been there on the front lines when the bombs are going off. He can relate to us in our temptation and in our trial. And so we have and enjoy that common frame of reference with our Savior. So there's a positive aspect to the temptation of Christ. But there's also a negative aspect. That is Satan's opposition. Even as the Father desired for the Son to succeed... In fact, knew that he would because of his omniscience. And it was God the Father's way of demonstrating the fitness of the Son. On the other side of that coin, Satan wanted Jesus to fail. And so he did everything that he could to try and successfully tempt the Lord Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us that the thief, Satan, comes not except for to steal and kill and destroy. He never has anything in mind for us that's good. And when he came to Jesus to tempt him, his desire was to see the Lord utterly fail. In Matthew and in Luke, the enemy is referred to as the devil, the slanderer, the one who comes to tempt and then accuse. How insidious. He tempts us, and then when we fail, he accuses us. See, you did... Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Fred Flintstone used to have the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, remember? But Satan's desire and the temptation of Christ was that Jesus would fail. So it was a negative thing. But here, Mark doesn't refer to him as the devil. He refers to him as Satan. 
the adversary, the one who opposes. Make a note. Anything that God is doing in your life, Satan will desire to oppose it. And when you know that you have heard from the Lord, you've been studying the scriptures, maybe the Spirit has quickened something to you, Satan will want to come against that. In the same way, he came against Jesus Christ. But thankfully, this one that would bruise the Messiah's heel would have his head crushed by that same Messiah. The positive aspect, the Father knew he was fit. The negative aspect, Satan desired to defeat him. There are also a couple of substantiations or, or proofs, evidences that are given. The first is, like I said earlier, the humanity of Christ. Sometimes we so spiritualize in our minds the image that we have of Jesus that we forget that he was a human being. Yes, fully God, but at the self-same time, fully man. So he experienced life. He knew what it was to grow hungry. He knew what it was to grow tired. He knew what it was to get dirty and need a bath. He sweat. Jesus experienced life. I mean, he knew what it was to walk on the dusty streets and get all that mess on his feet and, and need to have them washed. And then when his disciples were too thick to see what was going on, he did it himself and washed their feet. The suffering servant. Jesus, the human being. Yes, God, but also fully man, one who experienced life as one of us. The humanity of Christ is perhaps no better seen than in his temptation account. He was actually tempted. He was 40 days and nights without food and he grew hungry. Talk about an understatement. <laughs> I go four hours and I'm hungry. Went to a, a new restaurant the other day, tried it out on the way out. They were like, how'd you like it? I said, it was great. It ruined my appetite. <laughs> Problem is my appetite doesn't stay ruined. <laughs> now four hours later, here it comes, right? Jesus was truly tempted. He grew hungry. And he was tempted with the option of using his power in a way to meet his own selfish needs. But he didn't. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many Jesus was actually vulnerable. He was not going to use his supernatural power to be delivered, even though he was in the wild, in the wilderness, accompanied by wild animals, Mark says. He trusted in God's provision, trusted in God's protection. From infancy, he had been in God's hands. I mean, talk about trusting God. Jesus knew it was involved in childbirth before he came into the womb of a virgin. He knew what was involved in childhood before he came into the home of a carpenter in Nazareth. They didn't have Barnes Jewish Hospital back then. You couldn't, you know, ring up 911 when there was a problem. He was coming into a primitive existence, but he trusted the Father fully to accomplish his purposes. We see the humanity of Christ and his temptations. We also see his deity. He remained sinless. You see, Jesus was born of a virgin. He was not born of the seed of Adam. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and you will give birth to a son, the angel said to Mary. He didn't have the sin nature, didn't have the Adamic nature, wasn't born under the law, under a curse but he was born of a virgin to set the record straight, to give his life as a ransom for many. Yes, he was born under the curse, born under the law in the sense of relating to us, but not born of Adam's seed. Jesus enabled and empowered from the birth to live a sinless life. In him, Peter said, there was no deceit so it was literally against his nature to sin, for he was, after all, the Holy One of God. 
Satan tempted him. It revealed his humanity. It revealed his deity. And then the third feature of the Lord's temptation, angels attended him. Angels attended him. Quite frankly, what this means, first of all, is that they brought him food. He grew hungry. He withstood the temptation. Satan left. They came and ministered to his need. Of course, this wasn't the first time that angels had been used to attend literally to physical needs of hunger. We know that this happened to Elijah, that right after he had his encounter with the priests of Baal, and then Jezebel was threatening him. And he was discouraged and he was hiding out. And the Bible says that an angel came and brought him food. A angel food, right? <laughs> and it sustained him. And he too then went for 40 days and nights without eating again after that time. It's, it's interesting to me. Moses was also 40 days and nights up on the mountain when he was receiving the tablet from God. The other two that were 40 days and nights without food, Elijah and Moses, then appeared with Jesus at the mountain of transfiguration. Some interesting parallels that we see there in Scripture. The angels brought food, that they were instrumental in bringing the manna to the children of Israel when they too were in the wilderness. And now they came and they ministered to Jesus, providing for him, taking care of his hunger. No doubt they were instrumental also in his superintending the wild beasts that were in the wilderness. Well, the angels were not new to Jesus. In fact, they had been providing him with protection ever since his birth. He will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, lest thy dash thy foot against a stone, the prophet said of Messiah. The angels heralded his coming and then worshipped him at his birth. It was an angel in a dream that warned Joseph to take Mary and the child and flee to Egypt because of the dreadful manslaughter that was coming from Herod on the innocents. An angel then again appearing to Joseph saying, it's okay to return now to Israel after the danger had passed. They had ministered to Jesus behind the scenes, taking care of him, providing for him, and they should because not only are they the angels of God, Scripture tells us that they are His angels, the angels of the Lord. For when He appears, the Holy One will come with His angels accompanying Him in great glory. There's further affirmation, though, here when God the Father sent angels to attend Jesus. And I believe that it was just one more way at the end of this temptation season to say once again, here is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He withstood the test. No surprise there. Now send angels to minister to his needs. Finally, we see the victory of Jesus. That victory followed him in his temptation. Consider again the conditions of his suffering. He's in the wilderness. He's isolated. He literally goes from being in a mass of people the atmosphere must have been charged. This great preacher, John the Baptist, has been preaching revival. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make the crooked paths straight. Make the rough places smooth. Every mountain will be exalted and the rough places laid low. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Powerful preaching. The droves, the masses are coming out to be baptized. And there's Jesus. John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. What a magnificent setting. And Jesus baptized. The heavens torn asunder. The voice of the Father. The alighting of, of the Holy Spirit. The Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit. All together in this one moment of history demonstrating in a manifest way to the, to the people that are there that God is the living God. But from that moment of glory, surrounded by witnesses, enveloped in the Spirit, Jesus is driven to isolation. To isolation. It's a, it's a rugged scene. It's a place that is filled with wild beasts. We... We're over in Israel last year, and uh, 
animals, wild animals that are native to that region, certainly more so in Jesus' day than today. Things like wild lions and bears, leopards, poisonous vipers, wolves, wild bulls. You ever try to run away from a bull? <laughs> Mountain goats, big rams, I mean, all sorts of wild beasts. But I want you to notice, there's no indication here that Jesus magically protected himself from these beasts. I don't believe that he needed to. Jesus was sinless. And as the second Adam, he had dominion over the wild beasts, even as Adam had dominion over the beasts in the garden before the fall. Naming them, exercising authority over them. Jesus was with the wild beasts, but there was never a hint in Scripture that they threatened him, that he was in, in danger of being torn asunder. He was victorious, and we see his victory even over the wild beasts. We see his victory in the fact that he's emaciated, and yet he doesn't turn the stones into bread. Now, for us, that seems pretty far out and fanciful, doesn't it? I mean, when was the last time you saw somebody turn stones to bread? But we have to realize Jesus, the one who could multiply fish and loaves in his hands, the one who could walk on water, the one who could turn water into wine, for him to turn stones to bread would be like you and I flipping a light switch. The dog sees me do that and thinks I'm a magician. <laughs> I do it, no, I'm just throwing the light switch and electricity's getting to the instrument, right? And yet he did not fail. He didn't exercise any of his supernatural authority to meet selfish needs of his own. He was victorious over the flesh, not giving way to it. Notice also the completeness of his success. He literally defeated Satan face to face. Wow. That's amazing. He defeated Satan face to face and then went on to deliver the demoniacs with a word, come out. And if they talked too much for him, he said, shut up. And they'd clap it up. Why? Well, they knew he had already defeated their boss. <laughs> Jesus defeated Satan face to face. He came out of the wilderness and immediately began to preach. His victory was seen. And the sense that you get as you read this is shalom, peace. And it harkens back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, brooding like a hen does over her chicks. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And what we see in the first chapter of Genesis is God creating order from chaos, bringing peace, bringing shalom, bringing health and order to that which was disordered and chaotic. And this is the sense that we get as Jesus comes out of the wilderness is that he comes out of this wilderness experience possessing shalom, possessing peace, possessing order. Not only does he have the authority and the mantle of the Spirit of God resting upon him for his assignment, but he's got the affirmation of the Father, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And he withstands this test and angels are dispatched to minister to his every need. Well, Jesus is still bringing shalom and peace to our wilderness experiences today. If we'll simply invite him in. Invite him into the chaos and watch him turn that chaos into order. Well, as we wrap up our time today, what are some lessons that we can apply from this to our own lives? The first is recognizing the pervasiveness of temptation. The temptation is pervasive, that it fills the world in which we live. Recognize, first of all, that where did the first temptation come? It came in the garden. 
this pristine and beautiful and prosperous place of ease and relaxation. And that's where temptation came to Adam. And he failed. If you ever learned in your own life, sometimes it's when you're in the midst of success and prosperity that the temptation is the greatest. It's not when you're in the middle of the wilderness and you feel like you've got to call out on God necessarily. Sometimes it's when things are going well that you find you're like the rich man in the scriptures who said, life is good. Take ease, eat, drink, be merry. Tear down my barns, build bigger barns. You fool, this day your life will be required of you, God said. That sometimes that temptation can come in the midst of prosperity in the midst of a garden-like experience. It's pervasive. But it also comes in our wilderness experiences. It comes in a different form. You see, when we have got everything going for us, our temptation is to think, I don't need God. But when nothing is going right, we have a temptation to think, God doesn't need me. He doesn't love me. He's abandoned me. He's not answering the prayers that I pray the way I think they should be answered, so he must not care. Temptation is pervasive. If we're going to withstand it, we must then be prepared. And so the second lesson we learn is preparing for the trial, getting ready for those days when it's going to be difficult. So when things are going well, that's when we should press in even more to the Lord and really make sure that we are up to speed in our relationship with God, that we're solid in our faith, that we're rejoicing with Him, so that when the days come where we feel like the rug has just been jerked out from under us, that rather than going tumbling, we find ourselves kneeling at the feet of Jesus, saying, Lord, I don't understand these circumstances, but I know you do. I know you know where I'm at. I know you haven't forgotten my address. In fact, the Bible tells me you've got the very hairs on my head numbered. And so while I don't understand what I'm going through, I just trust you. Friends, it's so much easier to do that when we have prepared for those days by trusting Jesus even in the good times, by making time for Christian fellowship, by making time for devotions, by making time to develop our relationship with the Lord, knowing that the night comes, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And if we're not going through a trial right now, or we've not just come out of one, we're probably getting ready to go into one. It's the nature of life. Remember, trials are pervasive. And the final lesson that I want us to, to walk away with this morning is to understand that in life there is a lot of unfamiliar territory. And sometimes, sometimes we will find ourselves in unfamiliar territory, maybe even in the wilderness, because God himself has led us there. Really, Pastor Greg? Really? Yeah, really. Just like Abraham was told to leave his father and his father's house, his people, to go where? Disney World? No, God wasn't that specific, was he? To go to a land I will show you. In other words, Trust me, Abe. Trust me. Just leave. Just do what you're supposed to do, and I'll show you. You know what I've found? I have found that the Lord gives us enough light for our next step, generally speaking. Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Not a fog lamp, but just like a little lantern that you carry. And you've got to trust him because sometimes he's going to lead you into an experience that you don't fully understand. And that's when, just like Jesus in the wilderness, you've got to trust him and rely upon him. Moses appeared before Pharaoh, although he told God, I'm a man of stammering lips. You think that wasn't a wilderness experience for him? And yet God's the one who led him there. Remember this. Sometimes we can miss the greatest blessings of our lives simply because we are unwilling to follow the voice of the Lord when he's leading us into unchartered territory. But if we're like Peter and we will obey him when he says, go ahead, step out of the boat, then we will find a blessing that the other disciples 
never experienced. All they could do was talk with Peter and say, man, what was it like? You know, before you failed and started swimming, what was it like to step out of the boat and to take a couple of steps on the water? What wilderness are you in right now that you need to trust the Lord to see you through? What uncharted territory is maybe calling you into? Look to Jesus. Follow his example, and you'll find the Spirit resting on your life and empowering you just like it empowered Jesus. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, today we thank you that we can relate to you in your humanity, but even more importantly, we, uh, we take comfort in knowing that you relate to us, that you understand us even better than we understand ourselves. Help us to remember that and to cherish that truth that it might strengthen us for those times that we find ourselves in the wilderness. And we'll give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen.